Amen. You can be seated. So, uh, my favorite parenting story, uh, or favorite parenting experience, happened when my oldest son was just uh, two or three years old, maybe just turning three, right around there. And right from the time he was born, our little guy sucked his thumb. You know, he was just one of those kids. And he sucked his thumb to go to sleep and sucked his thumb to comfort himself and sucked his thumb, you know, on good days and bad days. That's just what he did. And uh, we didn't think that much of it, you know. Um, but sometimes it was inconvenient. It would wrinkle up his thumb because he sucked it so much. Or sometimes it would be a little sore and we had to care for that. And, of course, as he, he uh, months went on, uh, we thought, wow, maybe this isn't so good. And, and in particular, I became uh, quite concerned that this should stop, you know, any habit. I don't know. I just decided that he shouldn't do that anymore. And uh, I was quite convinced of this and working hard at it. And my wife was also trying to help him stop, but maybe not as convinced as I was that that was a good idea. Like, I was really pumped about that, and I was ho wishing she was more on board with me than she was. You know what I'm saying? Anybody? Really? Oh, thank you. Okay. So... Um, Anyway, that, that was the deal that was going on. And then there was this glorious day, and, and uh, this day that we went to the dentist. And you wouldn't think that would be a glorious day, but it was like my favorite parenting day ever. Because as we went to the dentist, as soon as the dentist looked in our little guy's mouth, he looked in his mouth and he said, hey, does he suck his thumb? And we were like, yeah. And he's like, he's got to stop. You know, and I'm like, yes, yes, I was right. You know, it's, it's actually the only time. So I keep telling the story, right? I just got to... Keep going on this. But um, he said, you know, his jaw's moving and this and that, and his teeth will grow the wrong way, and he's got to stop. And so we were on a mission after that to help this little guy stop sucking his thumb. And so we thought, wow, well, we'll, you know, we'll tell him if he does, uh, if he stops, then he'll get these rewards. And we tried that, and then we tried bigger rewards and bigger rewards and different rewards. And then we tried punishments, right? And different punishments and worse punishments. All these things. We could not get him to do this for the life of us. We tried everything. In fact, we even got a book called The Strong-Willed Child, you know, <laughs> read that. Like, how do you change a kid, you know? Oh, and we tried everything. In fact, at one point, we bought this yucky stuff that you paint on your nails. Some of you have used this. It helps you stop chewing your nails or those kind of things. And, and you paint it on, and it's disgusting. And so I, we bought this, and I thought, I better try it just before I give it to my boy, right? And so I, I just took, put a little bit on my nail and just taste a little bit, and it was so repulsive, so disgusting, so terrible, and I couldn't get it out of my mouth. I mean, brush it, teeth, mouthwash, all this stuff. I thought, that's terrible. I could never do that, you know, and so I never did use it, but it sat in the, in the cupboard there in the bathroom, and that was that, and we, again, we just kept trying and trying and trying, got nowhere, and one night I was uh, sitting at, at my son's bed and, and uh, putting him to bed and praying for him and so on, and I was reminding him that he shouldn't suck his thumb, that he always did to go to sleep, and uh, he's, you know, nodding and, you know, but dad, but dad, and so on. And again, he's just a little guy, like two or three years old. And uh, as I'm doing this, I'm, I'm leaving the, about to leave the room, but it dawns on me that he needs to learn a lesson that actually I've been reading in this leadership book I was reading at the time. I was reading this leadership book, and one of the principles, seven habits of highly effective people, one of the habits of highly effective people is that they are proactive, Okay. That means they take personal responsibility for their lives. They're not reactive to life. They don't just say, oh, I'm a product of my circumstances. They're proactive towards life. They take responsibility for their own lives. They say, I can, you know, control my own destiny, essentially, right? I can choose, and, and by my choices, I can make a difference in my life, and, and I don't have to blame everybody else. I take responsibility for myself. So I'm sitting there with this little guy, and I'm thinking, that's the lesson he needs, and I started into maybe my first ever awesome fatherly lecture. And I just looked at this little guy, I mean, he's like that big, right? And I looked at him, I said, son, you need to learn to be proactive, you know? And there he is. Okay, you know? And I said, you need to learn to take personal responsibility for yourself. And I said, mommy, she can't make you stop sucking your thumb. Daddy, he can't make you. All the punishments and rewards in the world can't make you. You have to decide it for you. Now, we can provide some of the outer structure, but at the end of the day, you got to choose it. you got to take responsibility. If we don't have you on side from the inside out making the change, the change will never happen. And uh, I used a bunch more big words like that. And as I'm sitting there lecturing him, he's just, you know, and I'm thinking, I am the craziest human being ever, but I've tried everything else. I'm going to try a lecture, you know, and see if that works. I mean, 
preaching seems to work other places, I'll try it here, you know. And uh, I finished up my whole uh, lecture, which I thought was a little bit insane, and I got up and walked out of the room, and uh, he was going to sleep. And about 10 minutes later, he called my name, uh, Dad, you know, Dad. And, and so I, I went in there, and he said, Dad, could you get me some of that yucky stuff? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean, what? what? And he said, you know, that stuff you bought that you never tried. Could you put some of that on my thumb? Because that might help me. And I'm like, oh, right? Like, oh, wow. So sure enough, I did. And he was there just trying so hard. And about half an hour later, I left the room. About half an hour later, he called me. He says, Dad, I can't sleep, but I'm not sucking my thumb, you know? And a half hour later, he still couldn't sleep. And uh, I'll tell you, he went for days not being able to sleep at night, struggling with this and that, but holding on to his thumb as tight as he could in his little fist and just battling and using every means we could give him as rewards. But he was on side, and sure enough, over the course of the next uh, few weeks, he broke that habit and... Uh, he got set free, and, and I was, you know, justified in all my uh, parenting and so on. It's the one, one success I've got, so I'm still hanging on to it, right? Uh, thank you. Hey, look at that. Okay. So what does that have to do with anything this morning? Well, here's the deal. Jesus taught his disciples a lot of stuff. He taught them how to love God, how to walk with him. He taught them uh, how to live in the kingdom. He taught them how to love each other in community, how to love people and serve people. He taught them how to have joy and peace in all kinds of circumstances. He taught them all kinds of things. But probably the most impactful teachings of Christ for me are the set of teachings where Jesus details out to his disciples that they are responsible for one little piece of territory called their own life. Now, Jesus uses a word when he talks about this, and he says, you are stewards of you. Now, a steward is somebody who takes care of something else or something that someone else owns that's been entrusted to them. And what Jesus taught his disciples and really teaches all of us is that your life is not your own. Your life is a gift to you to be enjoyed for certain, but also to be stewarded, to be taken care of, to be maximized for God's glory, that God has given you your life, and that one day, Jesus taught his disciples, one day, you and I will stand account before God for what we do with the one and only life that God has given us, for who we become, and what we do with our one and only life. It is the one piece of real estate that we are given uh, a control over, that we are given responsibility for. And Jesus, when he called his disciples to him, he actually called them disciples, disciplined ones, learners, people who come under him, and then they come to him. They, they take, again, responsibility for themselves, and they discipline themselves under Christ. And then, of course, he said to them, now, you've become my disciples. You've learned this. You've learned to steward your own lives. Now I want you to go and make disciples. Of course, the reality is we can't go make disciples until we become disciples ourselves. In fact, the number one person you are called to disciple, you know who it is? It's you. Yeah, the number one person God has called you to disciple is you. And so I'm excited to be starting this series today called Leading Me. It's the first series I've ever done in this whole area of just leading yourself. And I, I, it's an area that I'm passionate about. In fact, as my kids get older now, they're teenagers and heading into adulthood, I'm increasingly aware that I have less and less control over what they do with their own hearts, over what they do with their own lives, they are more and more responsible for themselves. In fact, John, when he, he wrote the letter of 1 John, he, he identified the spiritual maturity of the people he was writing to. He said, I write to you children, and then he says, I write to you young men, and then he says, I write to you fathers. And it's quite interesting how he differentiates children who know God's forgiveness from young men. And you know what he says about young men? He says, I write to you young men because you are strong and you have overcome the wicked one. It's pretty cool because young men like to hear that, don't they? You are strong. You have overcome. See, what happens when we mature is we gain strength. We gain the capacity to take care of ourselves. That's one of the ways you can define maturity. Have you taken responsibility for your own life? Uh, the way it says it in Proverbs chapter 4 wisest man in the world giving advice, he says this, above all else, you prioritize anything, prioritize this, guard your heart. Guard your own heart. Your heart is, nobody's going to be guarding it for you. 
right? You are the one who's going to have to guard your own heart for everything you do flows from it. Who you become, who you are over time is your fault, right? And that's good or bad news. But who we become is our own choice of how we have guarded our own heart. So you get to lead you. I get to lead me. And based on how we lead ourselves, that depends on what we do with the one and only life that God has given to us. And really, as we enter into a new year, the reality is, is good things and bad things will happen to us this year. I mean, you, you can't go into a year and say, will this be a good year or a bad year? The answer is both, right? I mean, we'll experience all kinds of circumstances this year, both good and bad. The question this year isn't, will good things or bad things happen to me? The question this year is, how will I respond? How will I lead myself through both the good and the bad things that take place in my life this year. And you can lead your life by design or by default. In other words, you can lead your life consciously and intentionally and with choice, stewarding the life that God has given you, or you can just let your life happen by accident. You can just sort of be a, a, a reactive person, just let life bounce into you and see where you bounce. But the problem with that is, if you just let life happen to you, if you don't lead yourself, if you just lead yourself by default, just sort of let yourself go wherever, the world and the flesh and the devil will all work together to pull you downward. And so it's only if you intentionally take hold of your life and say, no, I'm going in a different direction that you'll go in the right direction in life. This is true about every area of our lives, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't matter what area of your life it is. If you put intentional effort into it, it can go in a good direction. You take a garden and you just leave it, let it be, garden it by default, what happens to that garden? It just becomes chaos, right? So how do you take care of a garden? Well, you, you invest in it. You put time into it. You put intentionality into it. And it's beautiful. And the same is true of our own souls. Proverbs chapter 25 says this, A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Just whatever wants to can come in and go out. Proverbs 15:32 says that an undisciplined self-willed life is a puny or, sorry is puny but an obedient god-willed life is spacious. Isn't that awesome? Man, I want to live that kind of life. You know, sometimes we feel like leading ourselves, making the right decisions, pushing ourselves in the right direction is constricting us, right? It's like, "Oh, do I have to? Do I have to?" The writer of Proverbs just says, "Remind yourself in those moments that you're actually leading yourself to increasing freedom. And that if you just go the easy way, if you just go downhill all the time, you're actually leading yourself, even though it feels in the moment more free or whatever, you're actually leading yourself to being more constricted. Now here's the challenge though. When you try leading yourself, you will find it's very difficult. You're rebellious, <laughs> just to let you know. And so am I, right? Leading ourselves is hard. It's hard to lead ourselves. We tell ourselves, go this direction, do this, and then, oh, but I don't want to. And then we find ourselves conflicted, and we all feel like, wow, I have like five different personalities pulling in five different directions, and I'm trying to rein them all in and pull them all in one direction. It's hard leading ourselves. And that's why we need the power of Christ. In fact, in Philippians chapter 4, you know what the writer of Philippians says, what the Apostle Paul, he says, I can do all things through Christ, who gives me the strength. It's an awesome verse. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. You know what the context of the verse is? Self-leadership. That's the context. That's the all things that he needs the power of Christ to do. He says, I've learned in every circumstance of my life, good circumstances, bad circumstances, I've learned how to control my own attitude. I've learned how to find contentment in any circumstance of life. In fact, I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. That's where we need the power of Christ in our lives. You're not alone in stewarding your own life, in leading your own life in the right direction. So in 2016, this is my encouragement to you, and we're going to be working on this for the next few weeks together as a church, is learn to lead yourself with the power of Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Determine in your heart that this year you're going to lead yourself well, spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, in every area of your life, just determined by God's grace and God's power, you're going to steward your life in such a way that when you stand and give account for your life before God, you'll be able to say, yeah, Lord, I did my best with what you gave me in 2016.
So with the time that remains, I'm just going to address the first area of self-leadership for this series, and it's uh, leading myself in prayer. This is a good place to start when it comes to self-leadership because prayer is really about our inner lives. It's about the the inner world that we battle with. And the kingdom of God always works from the inside out. In other words, we work on the inside and then we see that transformation work its way outward. That's what Jesus taught uh, John in 3 John verse 2. He's uh, talking to uh, a believer and he just says, you know what, I'm praying for you that you would prosper and be in health or that things would go well for you. I'm just praying, I'm praying that your life goes well. But then he says this, even as your soul prospers. In other words, I'm praying that your outer life goes really good just as your inner life goes good. And that's how life works. Life works from the inside out. So we work on the inside of our lives and then we see that impacting the exterior of our lives. So there's two things I want to invite you to do when it comes to leading yourself in prayer. The first is lead my heart to God in prayer. How do I lead myself in prayer? The first thing I do is I lead my heart to God in prayer. Okay? I say things like this to my heart. Hey heart, you need to come before God today. Hey heart, this morning, before you get busy, before anxious thoughts hit you, before you start thinking about everything else, you need to remind yourself who your God is. You need to bring yourself before God. You need to bring your life before God. Hey, heart, let's go before the Lord. Sometimes we take our hearts and we go, Hey, heart, I've been thinking about you lately and I've noticed that you're sick. I've noticed that you're wounded. I've noticed that you've caught some of the germs of this world in you, heart. And you need to come before the God who is your healer. And partly prayer is just that. Partly prayer is bringing our hearts before God so that God can heal our hearts there. It's a big part of what prayer is. Sometimes we'll say this to our hearts. Hey, heart, I've noticed that you're weary lately. Weary. You just got, you're down. You're, 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 you're beat up by uh, the, 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 the busyness of life. You're worn, you're bruised, and you need to come before God, heart. I'm going to lead you before God so that you can get refreshed and rested and strengthened there in prayer. Sometimes we need to say this to our heart. Heart, you've been filled with shame lately. You know, one thing about our hearts, when our hearts feel shame, when we feel like sinners, when we feel that sense of yuckiness before God, do you know what our hearts want to do? They want to do anything but go before God. They want to run and hide. That's what hearts that feel sinful want to do. That's what Adam and Eve did when they sinned. They went and hid themselves. But we need to lead our hearts and say, you know what, the very best place for you would be to get before God the throne of God's grace and experience his forgiveness afresh and let him wash you clean again, heart. That's the best place for you. Come before God and experience that cleansing. Sometimes we need to say, hey, heart, you're confused. You're confused. You're running in every direction and you need to stop all this running and confusion and just get some clarity. You need to come before God and get clear. Come before your awesome God, heart. Find his greatness for your fears. Find his forgiveness for your sins. Find his strength for your weakness. Find his joy and peace and freedom and so on. You say, well, that sounds great. How exactly do I do that? You know, the book of Psalms is like a textbook for leading your heart to God. In fact, the book of Psalms is so cool in the Bible because it's the only book of the Bible that instead of just reading, you actually do it. You do the book of Psalms. Because the book of Psalms is just that. It's prayers. And so what the book of Psalms invites us to is to put ourselves right in the Psalms. And and I would encourage you, as you learn to pray and as you bring your heart before God, to just bring yourself into the book of Psalms. Pick a Psalm. You could start at the beginning and work your way through. You can start somewhere in the middle. You could pick your five favorites if you want. doesn't matter. Pick a Psalm. Put yourself in it and bring your heart before Because that's what the psalmists are doing. The psalmists are going, God, God, you're going to be my refuge. Uh, remember this in Psalm 42 where he says, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. What's he doing there? He's bringing his heart before God. Psalm 42 is a great psalm for just bringing your heart before God. God is my strength. God is my refuge. God, I'm going to praise him. I will yet praise him. See, the various psalms, that's what the psalmists are doing. They're just taking their heart in whatever condition it's in, sick or tired or weary or, or uh, confused or this or that and just saying, okay, I'm going to bring myself before the one who can restore my heart, 
before the one who can heal my heart, before the one who can make my heart healthy and whole, who can give me the right kind of heart. The only way my heart can become a healthy, whole heart, the kind of heart God wants it to be, is to bring it to God again and again and again. We bring it to Him in the morning. We bring it to Him at night. We bring it to Him at various times through the day. That's what prayer is. It's bringing our hearts to God. Psalm chapter 45 says, My heart is overflowing with a good thing. How did He get His heart to a place where it was overflowing with a good thing instead of all these bad things? I recite my composition concerning the king. He brought his heart before the king. Psalm chapter 16, verse 7 says it this way, My heart instructs me in the night seasons. It's an interesting verse. Because normally in the night seasons, that's where not so much good things are bred. It's where anxiety and confusion and discouragement and despair and discontent, that's where those things come. But David's able to say, My my." I, my heart instructs me in the night seasons. And you can see why when you look at the surrounding verses. Verse 7, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. See, that's where he gets it from. I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. It's in that space when I've brought my heart before God that then when I go through the night season, then when I go through difficult seasons and times in my life, that my heart is able to still be overflowing with a good theme, that my heart is still able to instruct me in the right directions and I'm not overcome with all of those negative things. So here's the question, and it's worth asking right now before we move on. The question is, what's in your heart right now? What's filling it? What is your heart overflowing with right now? Is it overflowing with a kind of trust in God or more of a kind of complaining and grumbling? Is it overflowing with a kind of joy or more of a kind of despair and be honest about that and then ask yourself okay how am i going to train my heart bring my heart to the place where it's going to be filled with the right things spending time with god allows god to revise to transform our hearts and here's the cool thing that happens when you do that when we bring our hearts before God, God not only heals our hearts, He not only makes them whole, makes them right, makes us who we were made to be, makes us more ourselves, but God begins to lay upon our hearts His vision, His heart, His plans, His purposes, His calling in our lives. We start to gain a heart for greater things. And this is part of leading your heart again. So, so you lead your heart not only to God to be restored, but then you begin to pour out your heart. So prayer is both. Prayer is leading myself to God and saying, God, I just need you. I need to meet with you. I need to connect with you. I need your life and your strength and your abundance. I need to remind myself how great you are. I need to remind myself that the things of this world don't satisfy. I need to bring my heart back to that place and tell my heart that what it really needs is the presence of God, not another TV show, right? And I need to tell my heart these things, and that's what prayer does. It's great. But prayer does a second thing. As we spend time with God and as God transforms our heart, prayer begins to pour out the very things that God lays upon our hearts. We begin not only to bring, find healing for ourselves, but we begin to gain a heart for others, for our family, for our friends, for our world. And we begin to pour out our hearts before God, really the hearts that God has given us, and we begin to do what's called intercede or pray for things. And it's just one of the ways that God has chosen to work in our world. He works through prayer. So he puts burdens upon us to pray for. And then as we pray for those things, those things get worked out in our lives and in the world around us. I want to just read to you a section from a, a book by a guy named Brian Houston. It's called uh, Live, Love, Lead. He's the pastor of the Hillsong Church in uh, Australia. He says this. Uh, it's about Hannah in the Bible, a gal named Hannah in the Old Testament. Hannah is another woman in the Bible who knew about the desires of the heart. She had a burning desire to have a child, even though it seemed physically impossible. Married to a man named Elkanah, Hannah struggled with her anger in her soul and a sharp, jagged pain in her heart over her situation. But notice that she refuses to give up hope, the vision of birthing a baby boy that God planted in her heart. Here's how the scripture reads. We'll put it up on the screen there. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord and Eli watched her mouth. And Hannah spoke in her heart, 
only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. <laughs> it's an interesting way, and this, I'll just read you what Brian Houston continues to say about this. And that's a fascinating way to phrase Hannah's petition before God. Hannah spoke in her heart. I know exactly how that works, although all of us, myself included, can understand this inner voice, this inner burning desire. Hannah spoke in her heart, and only her lips moved without any sound coming from her mouth. Eli, the temple priest, assumed she was either a crazy woman or drunk. Have you ever felt like Hannah in your desperate desire to hold to the vision God has given you? Sometimes you can't verbalize all that God has placed in your heart. You struggle to give voice to it. You can't articulate it and worry that if you try, it would only sound silly or stupid. Maybe those who heard it wouldn't understand and instead would think you're bragging or even delusional. But what God places in our hearts is so precious and beautiful, we must hold these secrets closely and guard them. Notice also how Hannah, Hannah's longing took time to come to life. So it came to pass, in the process of time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Emmanuel, saying, because I've asked for him from the Lord. Maybe it's going to take some time, maybe even several seasons of your life, for what's been conceived in your heart to come to life. So many dreams take time. Health restored, marriages healed, businesses started, children saved, families reunited, relationships mended. If what the Lord has deposited in your heart has not produced fruit, don't give up. Just keep hope alive in your heart and guard it. Close your eyes and make sure your vision remains clear so that even if circumstances seem to thwart your dream at every turn, you can keep it alive until God's time for it to be born. That's what prayer is. Prayer is persevering in the things that God has laid upon our hearts until we see those things birth on the outside. We start by pouring them out in prayer. And I love how uh, Brian Houston describes that and talks about Hannah because uh, I know this feeling of, of, of having something on my heart and longing to pray it but not having the right words. In fact, we as a staff, we pray every day here at the church. We start our day with prayer um, uh, each day that we start. In fact, and, and we do a prayer time uh, when we start our meetings, and so we have our prayer times there as well, and then we have pre-service prayer around here, and I pray with my small group as well. And I find when I pray in public, I don't know if anybody else finds this way, but I find sometimes I sound stupid. Anybody else feel like that? You know, sometimes my words don't come out right, and they don't sound right, and I can't really express what it is I'm trying to say. And I probably figure everybody else in the room thinks I'm either crazy or drunk, <laughs> right? But I just got to pray it out anyway because I'm pouring out my heart before God. And the beautiful thing is that God delights in those kinds of prayers. That that's really what prayer is. It's a pouring out of our hearts before God. Psalm 62 invites us to that. Pour out your hearts before God. And great things happen when people do that. When people are willing to step up in prayer and step out in prayer and pour out their heart before God in prayer, God hears and he answers. I love Jeremiah 33 3. It says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you don't yet know. God did it for Hannah. God's done it for many of you here. He continues to do it. He will continue to do it. God delights in and has ordained that prayer is one of the main vehicles through which he works and moves in our lives and in our world. And you know, this principle is true for our church as well. Um, we as a church need to lead the heart of our church first to God in prayer. Just say, God, heal the heart of our church. There's some areas that our church needs to repent and find forgiveness from God. There's some areas where we need to, you know, where we're weary and tired and we need to just gain refreshing from God. There's some areas as a church that we, we're weak and we just need to say, God, we're bringing this before you and we need you to strengthen our hearts. And that's why we do corporate prayer as a church. We bring our church, we bring ourselves before God corporately. And then, of course, we need to gain God's heart and intercede and pour out our hearts as a church. Say, God, this is the vision you've given us. This is the... The, the desires that you put in our hearts, Lord, we want to see them accomplished. In fact, I found this. I've been pastoring now for 20 years. And I found that every season of fruitfulness, every season of God doing amazing things in our midst has been preceded by seasons of prayer. You know that? We move forward as a church on our knees. That's where it's planted. Now, we see it work its way out into our church's effectiveness in various areas. But it always starts with seasons of prayer, pouring out our hearts before God, taking the vision God has given us and pouring it back to Him in request. And there's something about prayer that makes sure that what we're doing is done in the strength of God and that when it is accomplished, God gets the glory instead of us standing around and patting ourselves on the back. It's pretty cool. 
And it's true for us as a church. It's true for you as an individual. So we're going to enter into this week of prayer as a church. We'll be praying here uh, every day, Monday to Friday from noon to one. We want to invite you to come and be a part of that. It's going to be like a, a prayer meeting. People just gather in the room here and different ones will pray. Uh, maybe you've never done that before. Just come and experience it. And if, you don't, if you're too shy to pray out, we won't make you pray out. Uh, but, uh, and if you need to come late, you can come late. If you have to leave early, you can leave early. But Monday to Friday at noon hours, we're going to be here praying. Uh, on top of that, um, we have these evening prayers, 7 till 8 p.m. The evening prayer is a really neat thing. Uh, we started this just a couple of years ago, is the way we're doing our evening prayer. And it, it's, it's unique. It's a little bit different than the way uh, uh, I've experienced before. We take one hour, 7 till 8 p.m. And again, if you come late, you come late. If you, come, if you have to leave early, you have to leave early. Children are invited and uh, welcome to be a part of it. And we just take one hour for prayer, and we allow you to take some time for yourself with God. Here's what I find for my own prayer life. Maybe you find this too. But I can't keep my focus for a full hour. <laughs> so my prayer times tend to be significantly shorter than an hour. Sometimes five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, things like that. But when I come gather with God's people here on, on this given week of the year, Monday to Friday this week, I find that because I'm gathered and because the focus is so dedicated to prayer and we actually will, will uh, provide a little handout that pr walks you through four segments of prayer and has some scriptures for you to look up and then four different people come up, one every 15 minutes and just leads us in prayer. It's amazing that you, you can actually take an hour. And you know, the other thing that I find about prayer, especially prayer meetings in the evening, is uh, as, as I'm eating my supper meal and thinking about the fact that there's a prayer meeting at the church, um, I never feel like going. Anybody else confess that's true? I mean, when I think about what I'd like to do with my evening, I never say to myself, I just love to go to a prayer meeting, you know? For whatever reason, I never feel like it. I feel like doing everything but, usually. But when I make myself go, I just, oh no, I decided on Sunday I'd be there, or I know I need to be there, or whatever, and I make myself go, by the time it's over, I think, what was I thinking? Man, I'm so glad I went. I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I didn't just sit around and watch TV or whatever else. So I uh, want to encourage you to come and be a part of those as much as you can. Just come to the ones you can, okay? Look at your week and determine which, which of those noon hour meetings and, and evening meetings you can. Saturday, we have no prayer meetings. We're just encouraging you to spend some time on your own in prayer. And if you live with other people, whether it's family or friends, uh, if they're amiable to it, gather them together and take some time for prayer together on Saturday. And then, of course, Sunday in the evening, we'll have our worship night uh, where we just, uh, we're, uh, we always expect kind of the fruit from our season of prayer and fasting. And so we want to see God do amazing things in people's lives and we'll lay hands on you and pray for you and, and uh, have some worship time and so on. And again, it's all optional, but uh, that Sunday night is great. If you can't make it to anything else, try to come to Sunday night because... A really, really neat and powerful time. So that's that. And, and Pastor Barry mentioned it already, but let me just tell you a little bit about fasting, okay? Because we talk about this thing called fasting. People are like, what is that? You don't hear about it much. Fasting is choosing to relinquish something in my life so I can give myself more fully to prayer. Uh, it's most often food, right? So people will take a meal out of their day and say, I'm not going to eat this meal and I'm going to focus on prayer. Or I'm not going to eat for this whole day and I'm going to focus on prayer. Um, most people keep up their liquids, right, for health's sake. So it's important that you do that if you fast food. And then, so one day, three days, five days, seven days, ten days, you can fast for a certain season, and you uh, focus, you fast so that you focus on prayer. Now, you can fast other things, like Pastor Barry said, you can fast Facebook, or you can fast TV, or you can fast uh, something in your life that, you know, maybe sweets, or coffee, or something like that. Careful if you fast coffee, okay, just saying. But uh, <laughs> your family might not appreciate it, right? It'd be like, it's with you these days. So, um, but uh, you fast something... And, but the point isn't, okay, there's two things that the point isn't, and you need to know. First of all, the point isn't to twist God's arms. Fasting is not a hunger strike, okay? You're not saying, God, I'm not going to eat until you answer my prayers, right? Right? And you're not wrestling with God, okay? God is your loving Heavenly Father. He loves to give you good gifts. So it's not a hunger. It's, it's for you. It's wrestling your arms so that you spend more time in prayer. Every time you feel hungry, it reminds you, man, i got to pray. Or every time you realize, man, I'm not checking Facebook, okay, I'm going to pray. So it's for you. Um, so it's not, it's not to twist God's arm. And then the second thing is, it's not just like a diet or a way to stop watching TV, okay? If you need to stop watching TV, just stop watching TV, okay? If you need to eat different, eat different. 
But fasting is not for that, okay? Fasting is for seeking God in whatever area. So if you, if, uh, if you want to join us in that, everybody will pray about their own way of participating in that. Everybody does it different. Some people just take a meal a day. Um, some people take, like they say, the media or whatever. But pick something that you give up for the week so that you can focus more in the whole area of prayer. Uh, that'll be great. And then the last thing, and our ushers are just going to hand this out. There's a personal prayer guide that we're going to give you. And this is just for you to use through the week this week to take some time uh, on your own to pray. It has seven different uh, day, uh, devotionals for you to pray through. And each one just has a set of scriptures, uh, a, a little devotional thought, and a prayer that you can pray. And then some blank spaces for you to write down uh, anything you feel that God is uh, speaking to you about or, or working on in your life. Or you could even write out some prayers there. Um, so we'll hand those out and let's just make sure everybody gets one of these, and uh, I think we have lots of them, so if you need you know, two or you want to bring one to somebody else, feel free to do that as well. But um, that's available for you to use through this week to just help you get some personal time in prayer. And uh, you know, the whole idea of taking a week of prayer is not that we get all our praying done for the year, right? The whole idea is that we set the tone for the year, and of course our goal is that we spend the whole year being a more prayerful people, a people who lead our hearts before God in prayer so that our hearts are whole and healthy and then a people who pour out our hearts to God in prayer so that we see God work and move in our lives and in other people's lives. So here's my encouragement to you, okay? My encouragement to you is 2016, just by God's grace, by the strength of God, by the power of Christ in you, determine to lead yourself well. In every area of your life, lead yourself well spiritually Lead yourself well. You know, reflect on that. Where, what do I need spiritually? Some of you in here, you're not believers. You're not Christians. You can still lead yourself well spiritually, right? You can say, man, I need to take the time to think through my faith, to pray through my faith, to determine what it is I believe, to give Christ a proper examination, right? And so on. Maybe you need to, maybe you already believe that there is a God and you believe in Jesus, but you haven't really placed your faith and trust in him. Lead yourself well in that area. Bring yourself to a place of trusting in him. Maybe you haven't bowed your knee to him. Maybe you've got areas of your life where he's not Lord. Lead yourself well there. And then ex look, look at all the various areas of your life. Do them one at a time, but look at the various areas of your life and just go, I want to lead my life well this year so that I can be a steward of my life, working my way to increasing levels of freedom and wholeness, increasingly who, the person who God made me to be. It doesn't happen overnight. But by the power of Christ, you can lead yourself well when the Holy Spirit works with you. Let's stand together. We'll close in prayer.